so we are going to talk about the brain. And I did bring in, you're going to laugh, but I brought it in because I would never have a use for this other otherwise, which is my brain hat. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. <laughs> and I added the cerebellum this morning because it did not have the cerebellum. And I knew that you're kind of into the cerebellum. That was an optional add-on. And I didn't have enough time to cut out the other side and put the other side. So I only have one cerebellum right now. But this, I used this when I was teaching my kids. I was their science teacher for a year. And I was like, okay, we're going to only learn about stuff mom's interested in. So <laughs> this is my brain hat. And it has all of the lobes. And then it, I can send you a copy if you want it. And you can print one out and make it for yourself. I would um, love that. Oh, you that have to put is... the frontal lobe at front. So we are going to talk about the brain. And we're going to talk about some myths and misconceptions and sort of common things that people say about their brains all the time that may have be partial truths but are oversimplifications. And you're going to set us straight, Dr. Jed. So I have a few general kind of things I hear in my practice a lot, or I just hear when people are talking about brains. And, and the first one is, um, I think, re related to this brain hat, which is the belief that we only use 10% of our brain. Like we have this complex, cool thing in our head and that we'd only use 10% of it. So is that true? Yeah, I don't know where it came from, but I think there was a survey um, from about 10 years ago that found that actually 65% of Americans believe this, you know, that we use only 10% of our brain. So somewhere that meme got out there and I'm sure the internet didn't help. So uh, the truth is that no, not at all. You know, if you just look at how much of our glucose and how much of our en energy expenditure is used by any one organ, the brain surpasses all other organs. It's a very highly metabolically active and it's, um, you know, if you look at just the general neuroimaging of the brain, you can, you can look at, you know, brain metabolism or whatever. It's basically almost all of the brain is very active almost all of the time, <laughs> which is much more in line with how much energy our brain uses. So, you know, if you think about it this way, you know, our brain only weigh, weighs about three pounds, you know, it's a very small small part of our body in general, you know, even somebody who only weighs a hundred pounds, that's only still only 3% of our, of our body weight yet it consumes a huge amount of our energy. Yes. I used to use that as reasoning for, um, people with anorexia to eat, <laughs> which was basically your brain uses 20% of your energy. And if you aren't feeding yourself, you're, you're not feeding your brain. And that's yeah. why you feel a little bit foggy or you feel a little bit depressed. Like your brain, not only does it need glucose, it also needs certain types of fats and it needs right. precursors to make neurotransmitters. And if you don't have those things going for you, even just the basic nutrition, then you're not going to function so well in terms of your cognition and your memory and your emotion regulation. I love that. I'm, that's what a great way to help people help themselves. Okay. So you use more than 10% of your brain and you mentioned lots of your, your, your brain is active all the time. It's not just sort of one part of your brain. I think a lot of us talk about like my amygdala must be lighting up right now because I'm so afraid. And we actually may imagine our amygdala is lighting up. Yeah. <laughs> so help us there. Is it that simple when we feel threat or, or fear that it's just our amygdala? Yeah, another another internet uh, over simplification. The you know, what's a common phrase like? Oh, when you're afraid, that's your amygdala. Like you're mm -hmm. you're pointing out. No, it's it's not really how our brains work. You know, our brain regions are constantly talking to each other. So even talking about a little part of the brain is really just kind of like taking a little snapshot of a tiny bit of the picture. It's really that part of the brain is talking to a bunch of other brain regions as part of networks. And then networks are talking to networks, which is part of this whole, you know, brain, most of the brain being active most of the time. And if you look at the amygdala itself, it's really, so certainly it gets activated during fear, but it also, <laughs> it's basically there to help us pay attention to decide whether something is, you know, we need to move away from something if something is dangerous or not. And so, you know, just talking about it as this fear organ is, is a, is a vast oversimplification. 
Joseph Ledeau, who's he's mm -hmm. written a bit about this, and he's trying to like, he has a mission to change the wording around amygdala being the fear center. Mm -hmm. And his mission is really to, for us to describe it as the threat detector. Yes. Because it becomes fear when our frontal lobe interprets the threat. For example, if you're getting on a stage, the threat detector may increase your heart rate and make you um, breathe a little more quickly. But then if you interpret that as, oh, yes, I'm about to perform versus, oh, no, they're going to laugh at me, that will send you in different directions in terms of fear or excitement. Again, at this oversimplification of yeah, the Yeah, and another note to that, because Joe Ledoux is, is the man and the person, I should say, when it comes to. Um, to amygdala. He's been researching this a long time. You know, the amygdala is in, involved in all sorts of things, you know, besides just threat detection, like processing of memory, decision making. Uh, so all of these are, are really important. And as a side note, for anybody that wants to look up Joe Ledoux, he also has a rock band called the Amygdaloids. <laughs> and so you can find and they actually sing songs about the amygdala. Uh, so if anybody's interested, then go probably find him on YouTube, uh, rocking it out about the amygdala. Having seen him in a keynote address at a conference, that is like, I'm really having to Did that use just my blow brain, your brain? To, yeah, <laughs> to imagine that because it wasn't the most, uh, you know, exciting of uh, talks that I've attended, but okay. Very cool. Okay. So related to the amygdala, is that we have a lizard brain. And so people will say things like, oh, that's my lizard brain. Help us understand that a little bit. Yeah, so here it's helpful to differentiate what can be useful as a heuristic, you know, as like a training or explanatory tool versus what's real. And, you know, I actually went back and, and searched this out a little bit to see like, where did this lizard brain thing come from? <laughs> And, and Carl Sagan, you know, this, this well-known cosmologist, uh, wrote in his book, I think it was the dragons of Eden, you know, back in the seventies that where he highlighted a theory that a guy named Paul McLean had put forward back in the 1940s. And I think McLean hospital, you know, this famous psychiatric hospital that's part of the Harvard system is named after him. And so McLean had done these EEG recordings uh, with psychiatric patients, you know, very early days before neuroscience had even been developed as a field. And he was he was convinced that emotions were seated in deep brain structures like the limbic system, you know, which includes the amygdala, but also the hippocampus, the cingulate gyrus, these other really deep brain structures. And so he came up with what, what's called the triune model or this three part model where, um, and even as he put it, it, it's this relatively crude and primitive limbic system sits on top of the brain stem, you know, which he dubbed the reptilian part of the brain because it's involved in things that reptiles also have to do, like breathing and regulating their body temperature. And on top of this limbic system sits the neocortex, which literally means new brain. So layers upon layers was a simple and easy way for people to understand that, oh yeah, lizard brain, and then, you know, emotional brain, and then thinking brain. And to, to his credit, that heuristic is still helpful today. You know, for example, if our, you know, our neocortex being the youngest and the weakest part of our brain, it's the first that goes offline. You know, it's hard to think when we're freaked out. And so we can see how, oh yeah, that does make sense. But our brain, it's just because these layers are there, our brain is just really very interconnected and all these things are working together. But as a heuristic, you know, to, as an explanatory model, it's, it's still helpful. It's like, oh, why can't I think when I'm anxious? Well, you know, my prefrontal cortex is going offline. So it doesn't mean that we literally have a lizard brain. But that heuristic can be helpful to help us see, you know, kind of understand uh, how some of, you know, how, how we're acting, so to speak. So the structure of the brain does map on to evolution in terms of how our brain evolved. And it, it t tell me if this is accurate, it is that our brain sort of evolved just by like mostly adding on things. It's sort of like if you were remodeling your house, you just kept mm -hmm. on adding on rooms as opposed to demoing things and 
you know, remodeling the right way. <laughs> right. Or <laughs> starting just, like, like yeah. getting an architect in there and or an engineer and saying, okay, what's the best way to do this? So that's my basic understanding, but I am not an evolutionary biologist. So an ev evolutionary biologist would have a much more nuanced way of putting that. But if you okay. look even at how uh, the human brain um, develops, you know, from infancy in, into adulthood, you see these cells growing through, you know, forming, you know, layer one through, I think, layer five of the cortex. And so there we see layers upon layers uh, forming there. So my understanding is that that's that's how evolution put it. But I mean, I'm not the expert. OK. OK, well, here's another one that that is often heard, which is serotonin is our happiness neurotransmitter. And serotonin is, you know, if you're feeling depressed, you just need more serotonin and that will make you feel better. That we have some sort of depleted amount of serotonin, that's what's making us feel depressed or anxious. So help us understand serotonin as a neurotransmitter and uh, maybe some more nuanced ways of looking at it. Yeah, the short answer is it's complicated. Yeah. And I think this may be more of a heuristic and also perhaps something that helped people try to make sense when the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors first came out. So when they first come out, there was this huge excitement around, oh, here are these relatively safe medications that are going to help people with depression. And so, you know, we, we often think, oh, well, the opposite of depression is happiness. And if you are giving people extra serotonin and they're becoming less depressed, then they must be happy. If you talk to patients with depression, that's not exactly how it rolls. <laughs> and also if you talk to them about talk to them for the folks that do respond to an SSR, a SSRI, and I wish these medications were more effective. I'll just put, I'll just leave it at that. I wish they were more effective. Uh, but if you talk to people, you know, it, 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 it's not, it's kind of helping them have less low lows, so to speak, as compared to like, oh, now I'm happy. So that's a problem when it comes to it being the happiness molecule. The other is, if you look at where serotonin receptors are, they're all over the body. You know, the, I think the most of our serotonin receptors are actually in our gut, which is why a lot of people have GI side effects when they first start taking an SSRI because their gut's saying, whoa, where did all this serotonin come from? What's going on? And so it messes with things there. You know, that's not about happiness. That's about, you know, having to run to the toilet or something like that. So I think, you know, people want, we all want to have these explanatory models that are simple, that are going to explain the meaning of life in ways that we can all understand. Even neuroscientists don't understand the brain very well. And we do this for a living, you know? So it, it kind of got this idea around this being a happiness molecule. But if you look at it, it it's much more complex than that. Right. You would, you would see some different things, but there is some, I, there's some research on serotonin changing the way that maybe you perceive things. So for example, people that are depressed, when they look at an ambiguous face, they're more likely to perceive that face as angry or as hostile or disgusted than someone that's not depressed. And when you introduce an SSRI to folks, you actually see that change, that perception change. And that would make sense to me. Like if you, if you see people as hostile or, you know, maybe having negative feelings towards you, then you're less likely to engage with the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you see people as, you know, you kind of err on the side of people are, are generally good, then you're more likely to go up and talk to them. Right. And then that could yeah. lead to things like how you act in the world within can change how you feel. Right. So there may be some, you know, there may be some things that serotonin is doing that is, is changing the way your brain works, but we don't really fully understand it yet. And that's just one example probably of many other different things. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a really good example. And just to add to that a little bit, you know, serotonin does all sorts of things like regulating how much fat is made in our body, you know? And so we can think of this just building on what you're saying, like, how do these things function with regard to our survival? You know, how do, how do they affect how we engage with people all the way to how do they affect how much fat we store or how do we, you know, keep tra serotonin is also involved in tracking energy, uh, like how much we spend, how much we build up. 
Um, so all sorts of ways that, that contribute to things like, Hey, I need to go out and explore and forage to get food because I'm low on energy, right? Could similar to, I, I need to interact with other people, but all of that is much more nuanced than, Hey, it's the happiness molecule. You know, right. I'll, I'll just add as a, it's cl it's cousin, you know, th there aren't actually that many neurotransmitters that we have. And so you think of these like, I don't know what eight or probably 10 or something like that. It's not like there are a hundred neurotransmitters that do a hundred different functions. It's like this small number of molecules are needed to, to basically regulate everything that we do. And so they have to serve multiple functions and multiple different functions. And so, you know, it's like they're doing double, triple, quadruple duty to, you know, not just be this or that. So another example of, of kind of an overgeneralization or even a misconception is around like dopamine being, uh, you know, being, a, a you know, a, a happiness, <laughs> you know, like everybody's looking for happiness. And so, you know, people think, oh, dopam dopamine, you know, this involved in reward and it's, you know, it's gotta be this pleasure molecule. So I would say people talk about it more in terms of pleasure than happiness, but often we associate pleasure with happiness, but dopamine is not about pleasure at all. You know, so if you look at dopamine, it fires in in two particular instances. One is when something unexpected happens. And that's there to help us remember, lay down an emotional memory that says, oh, remember that. And so if somebody throws a surprise party for us and we're surprised, we're truly surprised, we get this big dopamine burst that says, oh, remember that. Or if somebody scares the crap out of us, <laughs> they're surprised in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> and we also fire, you know, get dopamine firing that says, oh, wow, that was that was really scary. And what that does, you know, with the, the the fear thing, for example, it helps us learn, hey, avoid those situations. So if we're in a you know dark street or something and we get really scared, that dopamine fires that says, hey, don't do that again. That could be dangerous. Notice how none of that has to do with pleasure. Right. And so the other time that dopamine fires is once we learn a scenario. So it's actually set up, you know, so we remember our food is you, you're foraging for food. Suddenly you find it, you, dopamine fires and says, Hey, remember where this is, you know, it helps us lay down context dependent memory. And then it fires in anticipation where it says, Hey, you know, your stomach's empty, go get some food. You remember where it is, go get it. And it's, so it's that itchy urge that says, go do something. Where's the pleasure in that? If it were pleasure filled, we just sit in the cave and be like, yeah, I don't feel like eating. And that's not very good for survival. So it, it's actually set up to drive us to do things. It's set up to be uncomfortable, unpleasant, so that we'll go do something to relieve that unpleasant feeling. So I, I just find that fascinating. It's one of the biggest misconceptions I've seen. Yeah, it, it's sort of changing the way we look at dopamine is not something like when people say they get a dopamine hit, it's not that you're getting a pleasure hit, you're getting a hit to remember <laughs> for this, remember where you got this, remember how good it was or you know whatever it is so that you'll do it again or you will avoid it. Yeah. The closest, I'll just add the closest that we see to, to pleasure is really about excitement, mm. you know, because we're anticipating the future. So if there's something that we're anticipating that's that we think will be pleasurable, that excitement is what people mistake for happiness. But in fact, excitement is not happiness. And, and it's a, like, oh, I can't wait. It's a restless, itchy, urgy quality. If we really look at, at, at it at its core, you know, an itch is not very pleasant. I was just talking to my husband about this last night because we're working on the summit that you were on it last year, the From Striving to Thriving Summit. And there's a lot of work that goes into it. And my husband's like my co-partner and doing all sorts of things for it. And we were talking about how much fun we're having, but it's all this fun in anticipation of the day when it releases. Mm -hmm. And I remember last year, it was such a bummer of a day. It was like, it's over. This is such a bummer. Like it's released. <laughs> What's it's next? Not as, it's not. As, yeah. What's next? The dopamine that keeps you motivated to keep going towards some hopeful future that it will be as as good as you think it's going to be. But it often is not it's so yeah. sad. <laughs> yeah. So I have to have other reasons, right, to um, pursue something like meaningful reasons. And um, good. OK, so I want to bring back my brain hat, which has all the different it really does focus on that neocortex. So it has the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe and 
the parietal lobe and the sensory cortex and the occipital lobe. And I added on the little part, the cerebellum. And apparently you're like a fan of the cerebellum. You think it's sort of one of the most under uh, discussed parts of the brain that there may be something important about it. So tell us about our cerebellum. We don't hear much about it. Well, first let's talk about uh, neurons. So we have 86 billion neurons and we have 84 billion non-neuronal cells like glia and other cells that that support new neurons like with with, you know, nutrients and, and cleaning things out. And so that's 170 billion cells. That's a lot. You ready for this? Of these neurons, only 19% are located in the cerebral cortex, right? The rest of them in the cerebellum. So the vast majority of our neurons are packed tightly into the cerebellum. So more than the cortex, and if you, you, you just using your brain hat as an example, the cerebellum is a lot smaller than cortex, so they're they're actually ta- they're packed in there even more tightly than they are in the in the cortex. So that in itself is pretty interesting. And um, it, if you look at the Latin for cerebellum, it literally means little brain in Latin. So it's you know not only does it have you know the the majority of our neurons, but it actually, um, we don't know a whole lot about its function because we've spent so much time studying the cortex. Uh, but it's, so just as an example, in the nineties, there was a 22 year old college student that had a tumor removed from her cerebellum and she started exhibiting strange behaviors, including acting inappropriately, like undressing in the hospital corridors and things like that. It took her like two decades before her decision-making returned to normal. And so that gave people the wake up call to say, you know, we often think about cerebellum. What I learned in medical school was like, you know, it's about coordination of, of movement. That's just a, probably just a tiny piece of what the cerebellum does. So, you know, it does muscle coordination, but it also seems to be really in sync with the cortex, you know, so it's probably involved in things like language, emotional processing, even helping with divided attention and even autobiographical memory recall. So there's a lot more that we don't know than what we do know, but I think it's helping us all wake up to say this little brain is actually a big part of what the brain does and how it functions. Well, this is good because I think what you're showing us in this conversation is that we have these really simplistic views of something that's quite complex. And actually, even neuroscientists don't have a full picture or understanding of it yet. It's like outer space, you know, <laughs> there's yeah. like we have some, you know, some landmarks, we have some idea of what's going on, but there's still a lot more that we don't know. And this is our very own brain. I mean, this is just fa- it's fascinating to me. And I love the update because I think that we need to update our information from time to time. We learned something 20 years ago in graduate school or college, and we just kind of hold on to it. And then we take in information from Instagram and social media, and we think that that's the update. So this is a helpful update for all of us. Any other brain sort of things that interest you about the brain that also could help apply to our life, you know, in terms of you could inform us in terms of our well-being and how we act in the world? Well, there is, there is so much, (laughs) there is so much, maybe I'll mention one other thing, which is, you know, I think links up some of these heuristic concepts that we talked about before, you know, so this triune or this lizard brain, you know, it, I say that it's a helpful heuristic because we can, we can look to see what is pragmatically helpful and what is you know, what we see in our own experience that is, that is true about these brain hierarchies. So, you know, we form habits, for example, and then we, you know, our, our neocortex helps us learn new things. And so we revert back to old habits when our neocortex goes offline. So, so what's the neocortex doing? One thing I want to highlight is it's really, it's, it's, involved in helping us plan for the future. And so it takes past experience and it says, you know, basically, you know, it forms probabilities about what might happen in the future based on our past experience. This is where this phrase, what's the best picture, what's the best predictor of the future, the past, you know, past experience. 
so here I, I like to think about, you know, what is the, what's the neocortex doing? How is it helping us plan for the future? And this, this process is called predictive processing. processing. So uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett and others have done a lot of really great work in discovering and also describing how this works. Uh, Lisa's brilliant at, at being able to make take these complex concepts and, and distill them in a way that we can understand that are not oversimplified. So imagine you know, something like having to, if we had to relearn everything every day, you know, we'd be, we'd be exhausted before the morning was over. And so our brain has to be efficient in how it spends its time. And when the, one way that it does that is to kind of predict based on past experience. So for example, um, and I think of this as, as set and forget, you know, if we, it, whether it's a habit or kind of identifying an object, we can, we kind of get an idea of what that's like. And then we kind of, we get a, we see something that is like that. And based on context, our brain is just going to assume it is that. So for example, um, if we've learned what a cat looks like, our brain basically assumes if there is some cat like object walking through our house, like our cat usually does, and maybe it's the same shape and size, then our brain's just going to assume, oh, that's a cat. Well, if it's a little, I don't know, kangaroo or something, and it happens to be moving in the same way as a cat, we might not even notice that there's actually a kangaroo that's gotten into our house somehow. And until it starts hopping or doing something that jolts our brain out of its predictive processing mode that says, hey, there's an error here. Detection, you know, our brains are more more about detecting an error in a signal to say, hey, that's different than expected as compared to looking carefully at the signal and saying, that's what I expected. So I think that's one thing that's a really interesting mechanism that our brain has developed to help us uh, survive. But it's really about, you know, and, and it's not about saying, oh, you know, I'm going to look at this carefully and see what it is. It's about, I'm going to assume that it is this, that that's a cat until proven otherwise. So I just highlight that because I think that's that's a really interesting thing. And it also helps us see how we might, you know, if we don't pay attention, it's going to be harder to update our representations of the world. And it's, it's going to be harder to learn and change because we're going to assume everything's the same until something has changed so much that it's, it forces us to pay attention. So I guess that, that the pragmatic implication there is the more we can learn to be curious and pay attention. And instead of going, Oh, I know what that is going, Oh, is that what I think it is? That helps us stay fresh and in kind of in a growth mindset as compared to in a fixed mindset. Oh, you know, that, that I, I know what that is. It's never going to change. Yeah. Be curious. And with relationships, we can see why this is a problem. We can see why this is a problem with biases that we, the implicit biases that we hold that we never actually look at and say, is this true? Mm -hmm. uh, and when we were at Plum Village, there's this walking meditation that you do every day, like an hour long walking meditation with the community there. And some of the signs that they put up were Thich Nhat Hanh's um, gatas, his sayings along mm -hmm. the way. And one of his sayings that uh, they put up that they hung in his beautiful calligraphy is, are you sure? Just that question. <laughs> and so we've that. been using that in our house a lot of like, are you, hold on. Are, are you, you sure? sure? Because mm. we assume all sorts of things. We assume based on our past experiences, but we don't update them. So <laughs> we're updating our understanding of the brain today, but continuing to pay attention and be curious will help you update your own brain and asking, are you sure? And looking a little bit more closely with more curiosity may open up some different perspectives and ways of seeing things. So I love thank it. you. Yes. All righty. Thank you, Dr. Jed. We will see you again next month and appreciate your work in this. And for those that want to actually take this, you have like a course on the brain, like a mini course in one of your apps. So if folks who want to take that course from you, where would they take that? So they can go to the Unwinding by Sharecare app. Okay. And it's a free app. Anybody can download it. Anybody can use it. And we have a bunch of mini courses in there that help people learn about their brains, learn, you know, all sorts of things ranging from what anxiety and stress are to how to work with procrastination. And there's a course in there called the Brain 101. And in that course, we have a bunch of modules that really go in depth into, for example, some of the topics we talked about today, 
but other, uh, you know, other basics of the brain as well. And the idea is, you know, if, if we can learn how our brains work, we can learn how to work with our brains. So I'd encourage anybody that's interested, download it. It's a free app. Uh, take advantage of it. Uh, Sharecare was very generous in making this free for anyone with the idea of like, let's help the world wake up. <laughs> very cool. Yes. And for those that want to learn about how to care for your brain, which is a whole nother series of conversations like inflammation and, and neurogenesis and the things that we can do lifestyle wise to take better care of our brains. In that summit that I talked about, which is also free, I have a conversation with Kimberly Wilson, who mm. talks about nutritional psychiatry and lifestyle factors to take care of all those 86 billion neurons, however many yes. you said in the, yep. in the billions. And then I'll also put a link to this brain hat so you can download your own. There's a kid <laughs> version as well. It's very useful. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jed. Thank you.